Yes. Uh, Mr. Bateman, I've got a, a number of questions from core participants to ask you. The first one is a point of clarification about the evidence that you gave um, in relation to the changes to the legislation made by uh, government in November 2017, and, and it's this. Can you clarify whether it is the position that um, uh, payments from the new schemes have to be declared to the DWP? Uh, yeah, that's what legislation says. So, what the, so, 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 so th those payments should be should be disclosed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we were uh, you were giving a, a, a evidence about the poor quality uh, of assessments and the fact that uh, many assessors have little knowledge of haemophilia. Um, are you able to assist with whether or not that question that that issue it is more acute? Um, for, for women with um, haemophilia because, because it's perhaps less well known that, that, that women have mm. suffer from haemophilia? I've dealt with very few uh, women with haemophilia uh, in this community. I'm not aware that they're... Um, no, actually, I don't think I've done any PIP or ESA assessments for women with haemophilia. I've done issues, uh, uh, I can remember one person who had, one woman who had very, very pronounced von, von Willebrand's disease and um, uh, damaged joints as a result of that, um, but her treatment, sort of treatment or mistreatment by the DWP was as good or as bad as, as anyone, other, any, anyone else. Um, I, I don't know, Ms. Bentham, whether you'll be able to help with this question, but um, are you aware of probate having been halted um, in, in any case due to the DWP investigating, um, carrying out an investigation into uh, the bank account of a deceased relative who was in receipt of scheme funds, scheme payments? Is that something you've come across? I'm aware, solely because I got an email from someone about it last night. And I haven't obviously haven't had a chance to, to look at that. I have dealt with a number of, uh, for solicitors, a number of cases that, where um, the DWP have um, lodged a claim uh, for alleged overpayment, re alleged recoverable overpayments of benefit from estates of deceased people. I was asking you questions about the. Um, uh, um, lack of knowledge and understanding of assessors uh, for people with haemophilia and for people suffering from um, HIV. What I didn't ask you and what I should have asked you is whether those same, um, there is that same lack of understanding and, and knowledge um, in respect of people suffering from hepatitis and in particular hepatitis C. Um, I think that's a much more complex issue. I mean, I'm no, no medical expert, of course. Um, but in my experience and reading the literature, the presentation of liver disease seems to be so, so very, very variable. Um, and it's obviously a much more insidious and um, complex... Well, sorry. It, it, it is a, an insidious and complex disease, from what I can see. And... Um, the problem with the assessments for both of both of us is that they're really very black and white, even though there's, there's actually now a substantial amount of case law um, to try to uh, make it a more nuanced approach. Um, and the, the sort of symptoms of hepatitis C are very difficult to um, fit into the boxes, if you like, uh, that, that are used for the assessment. with with Haemophilia and haemarthropathy in particular, it's much more straightforward. You know, it ticks a lot of the boxes a lot more easily. So yes, I think that it's a, it's, you know, it's a much more, um, much more difficult issue. And I've certainly seen over the years some really, really poor um, decisions on people with hepatitis C and and. Um, Failure really to take account of symptoms like brain fog and um, joint aches, um, generally feeling nauseous, that kind of thing. 
So it is what you're describing, re really two problems. One is that, that there may well be, it, it certainly in some cases, a, a lack of knowledge and understanding of hepatitis C. Uh, and secondly, even if, even if that isn't the case, the way that the um, assessment is structured and the way that the questions have to be answered are, are don't, are, aren't suited to capturing uh, the impact of hepatitis C on applicants. Yeah, that's very well put. Um, can, can you assist with, with, with this? Um, do, in your experience, do um, the registrants um, uh, applying for um, PIP, 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 for PIP, have problems in terms of delays um, and on appeal and so on, above and beyond the problems experienced by other uh, claimants for PIP, not, not in the um, registrant community? No, the, the delays are the same, they're universal. Um, and obviously at the moment things are rather very exceptional um, uh, because of the pandemic. But um, there, there, there have been tremendous delays in getting... I mean, the, there's no legal requirement, no statutory requirement or case law requirement on the DWP to make a decision on a mandatory reconsideration within a certain time scale. We tried and tried and tried in, in our lobbying activities and we failed, unfortunately. They wouldn't even have it as a sort of administrative measure um, that compelled staff to do it quickly. Um, and then appeals, there's just enormous backlog. It's, you know, difficulty in recruiting and retaining judges and um, the uh, medical professionals and, and other, the wing members in the, on the first tier tribunal. Uh, combined with a surge in appeals um, caused by DWP's assessment and reassessment activity. So I'm afraid everybody is a victim of this. Is there an outer time limit on the amount of time the DWP can take to assess a PIP application? No. Uh, there is some old case law, ex parte CPAG, going back to the 80s, um, which is of some assistance in some leverage. leverage. Um, Chop off the action group, have some template letters before action and such like, which can be used. If you've got an excessive delay, and that's a question, I suppose, of fact and degree in each case, if you've got a an excessive, de excessive delay, then um, one tactic that uh, welfare rights workers often use is um, to uh, send... Um, one of the, the pre-action protocol letters uh, to the DWP solicitors um, uh, 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 for sort of general breach of their of their general duties, um, but it's it's all kind of woolly and vague and lost in the realms of case law and equity, rather than anything nice and clear in the in the in, in the legislation. You've spoken about the fact that there isn't a. a any time limit on the mandatory reconsideration part of the appeal process? Is there any time limit on, on the second part of the appeal process? Uh, no. Well, except the... Hang on. The, the DWP are um, obliged uh, under the, um, the appeals... Uh, the, the tribunal procedure regulations, first-tier tribunal, social entitlement chamber, um, social entitlement... <laughs> Sorry. Social, um, social entitlement rules. chamber rules. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, they're obliged to produce their reply, as it's known, to the appeal. So in other words, their submission within one month. Um, if they fail to do that, the Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, uh, the Tribunal's Office, have a procedure um, for chasing that up and referring it either to a nominated caseworker or a, or a judge within HMCTS who can issue directions to them to, to compel them to do that. If they persist in their delay, um, one thing I, I do from time to time, when, well, when it's needed actually, is, is I then a, a, apply um, on an interlocutory basis to the, to the tribunal judge 
that the uh, Secretary of State, the respondent, is barred from further participation in the appeal. Uh, and when, those direct, when a direction to that effect is given to the DWP, it normally focuses their mind and they come up with the submission. Then, unfortunately, you have a very lengthy delay um, once that's in. Um, I mean, uh, I'm supposed to do my response within a month, which uh, I think I've always managed to do. And um, but then it's just the queue for, for hearings. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's got better recently. And interestingly, the telephone-based hearings, uh, I was reading a, a report um, just uh, last week, actually, uh, that the waiting times have reduced considerably. Um, the throughput of appeals is much better, and the attendance actually has improved as well. When benefits are stopped, what hurdles have to be overcome in order to have them reinstated? And how quickly or slowly does that happen normally? It's a woolly question, to be honest. Um, it's what you mean by stopped and which benefits? Um, you mean if someone was found fit for work, for example? Well, in the circumstances that we are speaking about here, so poor quality assessment, for example, um, yes. Right. Hmm. Okay. So how long does it take to reinstate them? Well, yeah. Well, what are the hurdles, and, and what's the what's the what's the, what's some sort of average time range for that? To, okay. To be reinstated. Um. Well, the, the first hurdle is to see the decision letter. And try to work out from that, then to get hold of the uh, assessment report, which in the case of a ESA is an ESA 85, um, and also if the client doesn't have a copy of the ESA 50 self assessment form, um, and try to put together um, some grounds, take instructions from the client um, in order to um, put together a case, consider whether there's medical evidence required or other evidence where they may have some, um, point out obvious inconsistencies that you can see and errors. Um, uh, it's not an easy process. I mean, folk do do this themselves. Most appeals to the first tier tribunal um, on benefit issues are people doing it on their own. Um, I think the, the level of representation is, has fallen remember correctly, I think it's about 10%. It's very, very low. It's a minority of cases. Um, and um, so they've got to, you know, have the wherewithal to do all of that. And that's a big ask. Um, and often people, and I've seen cases, you know, actually amongst the community, where people have sort of done that themselves and, um, you know, often actually not done it very well. Um, sometimes made their case worse, um, and um, and then you've got you you know people get very intimidated when they get the DWP's submission. You know, hundred papers arrive on their doormat, and it's it, you know it's quite common for people, or it's not uncommon, for people to say, "Oh, I can't proceed with this anymore." Um, another thing that's also happened as a result of the two-tier appeal process that came in, in in October 2013 is that the numbers of appeals to the first tier tribunal dropped by about 40% almost overnight. Uh, the DWP said that uh, they had to bring in this process because people were producing evidence at hearings and that could have been produced at an earlier stage. I've always disputed that. I said that you could simply change the procedure to draw out that evidence very early on in the appeals process um, and, and revise accordingly, revise the decision accordingly. Um, and so a lot of people get appeals fatigue. Um, we said that would happen. We told the DWP through the various consultative bodies that, that we're involved in, that I'm involved in, um, and, uh, and it's come to pass that that's the case. I'm sorry, I'm a bit cynical about all this because the DWP have been losing appeals left, right and centre, hand over fist when it comes to benefits like ESA and PIP. Uh, and I've given the, the success rate of appeals. That gets picked up by the press and is used um, to criticise the DWP's performance. 
and so I know ministers are highly sensitive about it. So was it a coincidence that they introduced a two-tier um, process that would have the effect of reducing the numbers of appeals? I have to ask them. Uh, and are you able to give us a, 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 an idea of the sort of time range that those steps that you've outlined might take? Well, assuming the person contacts you um, fairly quickly after they've had the negative decision, um, to turn around a mandatory reconsideration and get it, get it off to the DDBP is round about two, two to three weeks, depending on the case and what evidence is to hand. And then, as I said earlier, you know, the, how long is a piece of string? Uh, sometimes they turn around mandatory reconsiderations very quickly. Um, increasingly, actually, to be fair to the DWP, they've got a lot better at revising. I mean, we went through a stage when it first came in, they're only revising about, I think, 10% of mandatory reconsiderations in the appellant's favour, in the claimant's favour. And it's now up, I think, about 50% for disability benefits. Um, uh, it's it's you know it it can be a long wait at the moment it's a horribly long wait, and they are prioritising uh, mandatory reconsiderations where someone has no money. So if it's a if it's a dispute about the rate to pick, for example, that you can just expect to wait for a very long time. And indeed, I am on cases at the moment. And then appeals, you know, it can be twelve months, six to nine months once you've submitted the the notice of appeal. Um, to HMCTS is 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 uh, is usually a sort of kind of benchmark time scale I give folk. What are the trick questions asked by the DWP in assessments with which um, with which registrants of the McFarlane or the Caxton Fund have had difficulty? Okay, uh, well, it's not the DWP who asks those questions; it's their their private um, medical assessors, companies that do it. Um, but uh, the, the most common one is, how long can you walk for? And people reply. I mean, if I was to ask you that, you know, um, uh, you, you, you'd probably respond, oh, you know, I can you know, do, uh, you know. And typically people say, oh, I could do a couple of minutes and then I have to stop. And it's a sort of rhetorical answer that folk give. And that gets taken very literally. And there, there is some uh, figure somewhere that the DWP have got um, for, uh, based on some uh, uh, research by a government road traffic research unit, I think it was, some time ago, um, about how the people walk at four miles an hour. And therefore, if you say you can do two minutes, then you know that's going to be more than 50 metres. And you, you therefore can't get the enhanced rate mobility component and you lose your motability car. I mean, that, that's one of the trick questions. Um, the other is um, uh, questions about walking a dog. Um, you know, do you have any pets? Yes, I have a dog. Do you take the dog out for a walk? Yes, I do. Um, which, in, which is then used to in, infer that someone has all sorts of walking, walking and other abilities, such as the ability to, to hold a dog that's pulling on a lead. Um, when you drill, if you drill down and ask the question properly, as I have done and as I do, you find, for example, the, um, the, the dog walk consists, uh, for example, of them opening the back door and letting the dog out to run around the garden. Um, uh, what other ones are there um, that come up? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, sitting and watching television. Um, that happens in ESA. Um, do, are there any TV programmes that you like? Oh, yes, I like watching the news or EastEnders or whatever at Coronation Street um, and okay so the news is half an hour um, and that is used to infer um, some sort of ability because one of the activities they assess is, is your ability to sit and stand um, um, it sort of goes on like that really so that, that's used, you, used to assume that you can sit for 30 minutes without having to get up to relieve your back or whatever it is? 
Yeah, that's right. There, and there's some rather unhelpful case law. And, sorry, I've got a, a shadow on my screen. Is it showing at your end? I just wonder if I need to uh, adjust the angle of the... It is, yes. It, it is, yes. Yeah. Can, I, can I just try that better? Or? Uh, probably not. I, I, I think we'll, we'll bear with it. We, you, you've had it since we came back on the, on the break, but it's... Um, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we would need the technical guys to, to get in and do it, and let, let's just move on, because I think it might be quicker. Yeah, I think it's because of fading light outside. I, I think that's almost certainly the case. If you have anything, any f f other light you can put on in, inside, that might help. Yes, I do, if I can try oh, that. Yeah, tr try that. Yeah. Now that, I think, is very much better. Yes, it is, yeah. How, how useful would it be there for there to be a definitive policy and information statement covering all aspects of the community's engagement with the DWP? Sorry, I'm not sure what that question means. Uh, perhaps I'll come back to that because I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it means either. Um, um, I, I think... Can I, can I put it this way? Uh, do you think um, it, it could be possible for you or, for that matter, the DWP, I don't know who the question was aimed at, to put down on, on a couple of sides of A4 uh, what the policy of the DWP is uh, and how to deal with it when they get in touch? Or is life more complicated than that? I wish it was that simple. Um... So the answer is not very easy. No, you can you can um, summarise um, benefit entitlement and and what the eligibility criteria are. Um, it, it's a, with bullet points. Um, for example, the uh, spinal injuries charity Aspire have a really good. Um, I think it's just two sides, um, very nicely designed leaflet on their website explain to people the, the basic principles of personal independence payment. Um, it, uh, you can summarise very shortly, um, you know, very briefly, uh, some tips for people on how to deal with the Department for Work and Pensions. I mean, that, that, that probably wouldn't be too difficult. I mean, just simple things like, you know, having your, your national insurance number and which numbers are, which telephone numbers are, what, are which. Um, it's really unfortunate that the DWP have been very, very resistant historically to having electronic access, unlike just about every other government department. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they raise all sorts of issues about security and, and, su and such like. Um, and uh, if they could find a way around that, it would be very beneficial for people. Is there a list of passported conditions or special conditions um, within the DWP? Which benefits? I think I think in your witness statement you say I think you do talk about special conditions, don't you? I'm not sure. It, I've now forgotten which special one. rules. Special rules. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Is, is uh, viral hepatitis or indeed HIV on the list of... Is, is that contained within the special rules? Used to, well, HIV used to be, and that was one of the, one of the reasons a lot of McFarlane Trust uh, registrants managed to get uh, awards of uh, the higher, higher rates of uh, disability living allowance and, and incapacity benefit. It required certification by a medical practitioner that um, their life expectancy could reasonably be stated as being six months or less. Um, uh, I don't think it's possible to do that in the case of, of um, hepatitis C, um, unless obviously it's getting towards more serious liver disease. Um, uh, in the case of HIV alone, um, because the treatments have moved on, we can't really argue um, 
that uh, the special rules apply, and indeed when people have tried that, they get turned down. Oh, oh, um, that, oh sorry. I, I, I mean, I, I did try on, um, in the early days of ESA, there's a provision in Regulation 20 of the Employment and Support Allowance Regulations 2008. It's known as the known oh, okay. health provision to try and um, use that to passport people through uh, the work capability assessment for ESA. Um, I have to say it failed, sadly, but you, know, you try these things, especially in early days of a new benefit. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You've described a range of services that you provide to um, EVE's registrants. Are, are you able to provide all of those um, services to the SIBS registrants as well? Could do, um, but I'll, I'm going to say something um, about my future. Um, d uh, I presume you're going to say that, at the, at the, you'll come to that at the end, will you? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do is it your understanding that before you received the telephone call in August 2020 from SIBS that there was no benefit that, that, that the SIBS registrants were not receiving any benefits advice yeah that's what I was told um, can I just say when at the point of um, setting up the new um, support schemes I had I think three or four Scottish cases and um, SIBS did agree to um, pay me to finish those cases off. I mean, they were, it was fairly much the tail end of them. Um, and I remember asking, are you going to make any arrangements? Because um, in Scotland, the supply of advice services is, is way better than in England. Um, and it goes back to the 15th century, where the principle of legal aid, I think, was held to be important constitutional principle in Scotland um, and and having I mean having written the Scottish government standards for advice and also um, knowing lots of, of uh, advice workers in Scotland and you know there are it's just much much healthier I mean the need may be greater but the supply and availability of, of advisors in Scotland is much much health healthier um, one thing about Scotland is is that the following the, the referendum on independence um, the Cameron government agreed that there could be some very some um, devolution of social security matters to Scotland the Scottish government and they are pressing ahead with a number of changes so gradually over time the Scottish social security system will become different to the English one um, and particularly in relation to um, benefits for long-term illness and disability um, and I'm not really going to be up to speed with those when those changes come in. Um, would entitlement um, to receive certain benefits have been an accurate way of establishing uh, what a registrant's level of need was or is without further assessment of disability needing to be undertaken by the McFarland Trust or the Caxton Foundation or indeed the new schemes? I think sometimes you see that referred to in, in the documentation as using the assessment undertaken by the benefits agencies as a proxy for um, uh, understanding the needs in the context of the trusts and schemes. Yeah, so just to be pedantic, the benefits agency hasn't existed since Sorry. 2000. I, I, um, yes. Yeah, no, I don't use maybe the word generically, but I'm, it's important to be precise about uh, these things. Um, the... Um, as an assessment of financial need, I would say yes. Um, you know, if someone's receiving income support, for example, or income-related employment support allowance, um, they, if they are also renting property and they claim housing benefit, they don't have to be means-tested again for housing benefit. There's a, it's called a passport actually. Um, system of passporting people over onto the maximum entitlement to housing benefit. It doesn't mean they get all their, all their rent met, but it's the maximum entitlement to housing benefit, which is, cuts out a load of bureaucracy and double means testing, and, and it all happens seamlessly behind the or should happen seamlessly behind the scenes, uh, so the customer's unaware of it. Uh, and what about in relation to health, health needs? I 
don't know. I don't know about that. Um, because the criteria for assessing putate pit, for example, there are, if I remember correctly, there are nine daily living activities that they assess and two mobility ones. But there's, there's things that they don't assess for pit, such as your ability to lift yourself out of a chair. Um, uh, they don't assess your ability to go up and down stairs, which I've, which I've always done. Um, the assessment of mobility um, is based, according to the case law, on your ability to walk to um, uh, over on ordinary outdoor paved surfaces, including curbs, um, uh, on, on that's level, but you know, not not uphill, not on a not on an incline. So I think there would it could be problematic, is what I would say. What was the role of the DWP working group on haemophilia and contaminated blood? Uh, and what, if any, improvements in the system of benefits for these communities has it been able to achieve? Well, I think that the really the one, the, um, well, I think there were two achievements. One is that it was fed into ministers, so the ministers were more aware of the needs of the community. Um, and that, that's always a good thing, even if it doesn't produce a tangible outcome. Um, the other was the fact that it was clearly instrumental in, in getting um, this review carried out of personal independence payment for people with haemophilia. Not, you know, not just people with haemophilia who've got infected blood either, but just people with haemophilia who've claimed PIP. Um, and uh, so that was a very good outcome. And the... Uh, you know, the results of that have continued, albeit I continue to get cases that I dispute. But as I said in my evidence, you know, things are better than they were. Um, you, you asked whether you'd use the word instrumental, which is the word I put to you when I asked you a question about that, and I've checked back to your witness statement, and it's not a word that you used. It's, it was my word. So yeah, I don't want worry, to make that's that not clear. a problem. Uh, and last question, um, would clear nationally circulated advice from the DWP have assisted in avoiding the issues registrants have experienced with benefits disregard? Well, there was some clear guidance. Um, uh, that they are enclosed uh, one of the exhibits in my witness statement is the the letter it was known as the people called it the waiver letter, which I'm well, probably not really the right phrase, but um, and there was guidance that was issued to staff, DWP staff. The problem is, as I said in my witness statement, um, there are what well, I mean, there are millions of people who, who claim means tested benefits, and um, so. When you've got a community of 2,000, maybe, who are claiming means tested benefits, who are people infected or affected, um, it's such a tiny proportion of that, and it's, you know, the, the information just gets lost. I, me I remember once talking to a DWP official who was very long standing, actually, it was John Armstrong, and he, sa he said in his entire career, he spent his entire career in the DWP, he said he had dealt with one such case. So th those are all the questions um, I I'm, I'm going to ask from the core participants. Well, I, I have uh, no, no further questions to ask. Uh, Mr Bateman, would you like to add anything to your evidence? I'd just like to make a couple of points, and sorry I won't give long answers this time. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I am immensely proud uh, of what I have achieved for this community. I mean, I work through my my monthly reports, and they're not they're not outcome fi outcome figures. But uh, since 2011, there were 945 people I have advised or assisted uh, uh, in some form, and um, total extra benefit gains. I mean, these are rough figures because I never kept outcome figures, but. I've helped people claim £3 million worth of benefits in that time. Um, it's been a privilege to work for them. People have, have opened up and told me about their lives. Um, 
it's been very moving, very powerful. Um, uh, preparing for this inquiry has been very, very difficult for me emotionally. It's brought back memories of people I had very good working relationships with um, who are beneficiaries, who are no longer with us, people who are dying um, and suffered terribly. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're acting as someone's advocate, you, you put those feelings away in a box and you push them out of the way because they won't help you help the client. Um, and I have found those feelings have really come, come to the fore. Uh, I am now 65. Um, I'm not getting any younger. I've found generally the work emotionally, um, intellectually and, and physically demanding. So it's, it is my intention actually to retire uh, this year. I have informed England Effective Love Support Scheme uh, and, and asked them to consider making some succession planning. The other point I would make is really about the impact of welfare reform. That you know, if one looks at the research on it, um, since 1978, the value of means-tested benefits has fallen as a proportion of average earnings from 38% to 17%. Um, the Disability Benefits Consortium has estimated that since 2010, the average person with a disability has lost benefits to the value of £1,200 a year. Um, and nearly f um, the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility identified that there was a cut of between 9 and 17% in spending on working age social security um, claimants with a 5 billion cut from disability benefits alone by 2018. That's had a huge impact on, on the community, an absolutely enormous impact. And it's why people have ended up having to engage in so much uh, dispute about ESA and PIP in particular. Um, and I mean, I'd really just like to end with that point. I, I, can I thank the inquiry for giving me the opportunity to, to get across this evidence? Well, I, I want to, to thank you in, uh, in return. Um, and can I put it this way? I, I wouldn't worry at all about the, the length of your answers because it seems to me they simply demonstrate yet again uh, what uh, passion you have for remedying what you see as injustice. Uh, you put that in context, in the context that we are dealing with, uh, because it's probably where you spend the bulk of, or have spent the bulk of your time uh, recently. But it, it's been fascinating to listen to uh, and revealing, as you can tell by the number of questions at the end. Uh, I won't take any more time because I'm, I don't want to take you away any longer from your weekend. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for your evidence. Uh, and, uh, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Brian. Now, Miss Scott, we're not uh, meeting next week. We're not meeting next week. Um, the week uh, after, we have a full week, have we not? We do. Um, we meet next, the week after, so that's Monday, the 22nd of March. Uh, and we begin the week with a presentation on Skipton. Uh, and then in the, um, after the presentation, we will hear evidence from um, Anne Lloyd. So Monday, 10 o'clock. Monday, that is not the coming Monday, but Monday the 22nd uh, of February, uh, of March. Thank you very much.